Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. A special celebration is on our menu today. We are in the 100th year of the birth of Frank Sinatra. I've got the world on a string Sitting on a rainbow The voice, the chairman, the legend. Much is happening to commemorate the event, including this new book. Sinatra, The Chairman, Volume 2 of an exhaustive biography by James Kaplan. Mr. Kaplan is here to guide us through Sinatra's witchcraft. Next. I'm delighted to welcome to our program James Kaplan. Nice to have you here. Thrilled to be here, Tony. Your hands must be tired after writing 1,800 <laughs> pages. pages about if I, oh, boy, both hands. Yeah. Let's start with a, a crazy hypothetical. You're asked to talk to an audience about Frank Sinatra. You show up. You find out the whole crowd, no one has ever heard of this man, has hmm. no idea who he is. Hmm. What's the first thing you tell them? I would say listen to, the, uh, listen to the records, listen to the voice. I would say my thought is that if a thousand years from now some tribe in the future happened upon a trove of Sinatra CDs and a solar-powered CD player <laughs> and listened to those songs with no idea of even what the language was, that they would be affected Strong. Because probably of the, the quality of the voice, the, the way he presents the song. Yes. And they, you don't have to understand the words to appreciate the artistry. He had this amazing faculty of making you feel, when he was singing to you, that he was having those feelings and thinking those thoughts in the second that he was singing them. What made you want to, uh, want to write about him? There are a couple of things. I profiled Jerry Lewis in The New Yorker right. in 2000, and then after that Jerry asked me to write, help write his memoir. And as we were finishing up the book, uh, he invited me to the 2004 telethon in LA. And one night I went out to dinner with a bunch of musicians on the show, all men of a certain age, all showbiz veterans. And we went to an Italian restaurant in Santa Monica, Guido's was hmm. its name. And we drank a lot. We drank a lot. And we got very happy. Everybody was very happy. What you should do in a Exactly. The, the food was OK. The drink was fantastic. And about two hours in, everybody was extremely happy. And it turned out at that moment that they had all, at one time or another, worked with Sinatra. The so, musicians. Uh, oh, the musicians yeah. had all played, uh, accompanied Sinatra. And since we were all well lubricated, I kind of rubbed my hands and thought, okay, here it comes. Here comes the talk about the women and the mob and the fist fights. But instead, the voices lowered. And they all talked in reverent tones about what an absolute musical genius Sinatra was. And I thought, okay, that's pretty interesting because a biography had just come out where you wouldn't know the guy ever sang a note. It was all about the women and the mob and the fist fights. I was looking for a next project. I had grown up hearing Sinatra's voice in the 1950s. Uh, I had gone to Carnegie Hall in 1981 as a child of rock and roll, slightly tongue-in-cheek, and been completely blown away by this guy. He gave the most staggeringly great performance I had ever seen. So I thought, why not write about this guy as a genius, a complicated genius, instead of the thug who's with the mob and the women and the fist fights? It, it's, the scene you paint there uh, in that restaurant with those musicians is, is fascinating to me because uh, everybody refers to Sinatra as a musician. Yes. And I, I, I would certainly uh, agree with that. And yet... He never learned, he couldn't read music. He couldn't read music, but a lot of great musicians didn't read music. And in right. fact, the truth is that Sinatra, if you listen to some of the outtakes, the rehearsals, studio recordings, you can hear Sinatra say, well, in bar 47, that F is sharp. I think maybe it should be flatted. Well, okay. So he knew his way around a score. But this was a guy of Mozartian musical abilities, the kind of musical mind that comes along once every two or three hundred years. And I think people lose sight of that with all the mystique. Did you ever meet him or I interview him? I never met him. I never interviewed him. And uh, I like to look on, uh, look on that as a plus, because I think that when Frank sat with interviewers, 
Frank very much gave his own version of the story, and uh, in particular there was one, one conference he did at Yale in 1986 with the late uh, journalist Sidney Zion, whom I greatly respected. And if you could have attached a lie detector to Sinatra during that interview on <laughs> He's stage. going up the, up the river. Yeah, yeah. Uh, had you known at the start it would take 10 years, no. would, you, yeah. would you have? Yes, no, I, I would have. No, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I jumped in. Uh, my, my contract from Doubleday said, Life of Frank Sinatra, 352 pages. Right. Uh, I quickly came to see that that was nonsense. There's way you too much. gave them a lot more than that. I did. It's, it, it is, he was born in Hoboken in 1915 when horse-drawn carriages were pulling coal wagons and ice wagons around the streets, cobblestone streets, right? It was just a stone's throw from the 19th century. He died on May 14th, 1998, the night of the Seinfeld finale. This was a life and a career that mirrored and, and affected so much of the American. This was the American century. Sinatra was the American century. So it was a huge canvas to paint on, and I feel privileged to have had the opportunity to, to take this on. Well, let's look at some of the canvas. Volume two of your, of your biography opens uh, 11 days after he wins the Oscar for uh, as Maggio in um, From Here, from to, Here to Eternity, yeah. which uh, he rises from the dead yes. with that. I mean, yes. two years before that, as you point out, Irving Lazar had a big agent, a powerful agent. Swifty, yes. Swifty had said, this guy is dead. He's finished. He said, even Jesus couldn't get resurrected in this town, meaning Hollywood. Right. And what I say is, maybe not, but Frank could. How? How do you go from... From getting dropped the ashes, how do you yeah. how do you create a phoenix and rise from the ashes of the first part of his career to an academy? Award? Well, first of all, you have to be Frank Sinatra. But this is a guy who had been dropped by his not only his wife, but dropped by his agents, by his record label, by his uh, by his movie studio. MGM fired him. He they all dropped him, and he was broke. He owed the IRS a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, he was really on his behind. How, a lot of his comeback did not have to do with a horse's head uh, in, the, in the bed of a movie producer. It had to do with Ava Gardner, whose movie career was taking off just as his was going down the tubes. She went to Harry Cohn, the head of Columbia Pictures. This is when they were starting to put together From Here to Eternity, and told Harry Cohn, who was the biggest lecher in Hollywood, which is saying something, uh, oh, that, she, sure that she, that she, <laughs> Ava Gardner, uh, the most beautiful woman in the world, told Harry Cohn that she would give him a free picture if Harry Cohn would give her husband, uh, her no good husband, a screen test. And Harry Cohn looked her up and down and he thought, well, and what else is she going to give me for free? And he gave Sinatra the screen test and Sinatra aced it. And that's how he got the part. And uh, Hollywood is a rough town, it's a company town, it's merciless, but it l has a very soft spot for comebacks and happy endings, as we know. And when Sinatra got that statuette on the stage of the Pantages Theater, March 25th, 1954, Hollywood was thrilled. And that was, from then on, he was jet-fueled into his comeback. And just before that, if my, if my uh, uh, timing is right, he had recorded I, I Got the World on a String. He did. He which was a huge hit, or at least it was a... a it wasn't, actually. It was wasn't a, a it hit, was a, but it, it was... It, was it, it showed Sinatra. He made it with this unknown young arranger who he had been matched up with, sort of against his will, by, uh, by an executive at Capitol Records named uh, Alan Livingston. Capitol Records had picked up Sinatra as damaged goods, and when Alan Livingston told the sales force he had signed Sinatra, they all groaned, right? But Alan Livingston was brilliant. He teamed Sinatra with this unknown young arranger, Nelson Riddle. And when Sinatra heard the playback of I've Got the World on a String, he said, I'm back, baby, I'm back. He knew he was back. But it would be a long year between recording that number, which, by the way, did not chart, uh, until he won the Oscar in March of 1954. So it came out after the Oscar? The, the, song, the record came out before the Oscar. 1953, he made, he made those, he began to make those beautiful records with Nelson Riddle. He made From Here to Eternity. From Here to Eternity came out, got fantastic reviews. Sinatra got fantastic reviews, but Ava had left him. She was in Spain living with exactly. a bullfighter. Sinatra made a serious suicide attempt in November of 1953, only four months before he won that Oscar. So it, it, his life was like an opera. 
Well, that's, I want to get into that because it's so much a part of your book that here he is on top of the world again, yeah. publicly, professionally. Yes. But personally, he's, he's, uh, his life is a, is a disaster. He's, ju uh, he's just left or she's left him, Ava Gardner. Yes. Uh, and this was <laughs> a torturous relationship. I, I remember some lyrics of uh, uh, Lorenz Hart from... Uh, I wish I were in love again. The lovely loving and the hateful hates. Yes, I mean, that, that was Frank and Ava, yeah. 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 So, I, I mean, this dissonance between his yes. career yeah. and his personal life. Well, the career to him was everything, and the personal life came second, and that was the long and short of it. Tina Sinatra wrote in her memoir, My Father's Daughter, very good book. Uh, my father was a deeply feeling man who was unable to attain an intimate relationship with another human being. And that was the case. The music came first. Everything else was second. And it led to a lot of loneliness. It really made him like King Midas. Everything he touched in the 50s and 60s turned to gold, but nobody really close to him. His uh, biography could be called, it wouldn't sell as well as mm -hmm. if you didn't put the name on the front, uh, you know, uh, the, the tale of, a, of the loneliest man. Loneliest, I mean, right, the loneliest you know, guy he, on earth. He comes up, as you pointed out earlier, he comes up at a time of horse-drawn carriages and, you know, the, the great immigration. He's an only child. Yes. At a time when big families were the... Well, he weighed 13 pounds at birth, and his yeah. mother was under five feet. I think she decided she didn't <laughs> want to do that again. Yeah. His mother, Dolly, uh, many have agreed, and it's in your book, too, that she, she's probably the source of the great contradictions in Sinatra between, you know, the, the highs and the lows. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. She, she, they were, she was a strange... Uh, well, she was an extraordinary woman. Extraordinary. She was a brilliant woman. She spoke every dialect of Italian. She was a Democratic Party organizer in Hoboken. She used to go around drumming up the vote, and she had to go to all these apartments with the Italian-Americans. She knew all the dialects. She was a midwife. She was an abortionist. She made money during the Depression. She was she brilliant. She ran a bar. She ran a bar. Marty, with an Irish name. Marty O'Brien's. That was Marty Sinatra, uh, Frank's dad had a brief and uh, unsuccessful career as a bantamweight prize fighter, and he called himself Marty O'Brien because prize fighters were supposed to be Irish in those days. Uh, they used to keep a billy club behind the bar right. uh, in case there was trouble, and now and then when Frank was trouble, Dolly would smack him with it. He said in later years he never knew whether she was going to hug him or hit him. So she was unpredictable, and uh, it, it did not lead to a lot of confidence on his part in women. Vo Dolly, volcanic, brilliant, uh, impatient. Uh, I think Frank told um, Pete Hamill uh, one time that about women and his relationship with women and talking about his mother, who, as you say, he didn't know if she was going to hit him with the club mm. or, or give him a, an embrace. He said, I think I married, he didn't say I think, he said I married the, that same woman every time. What mm. do you think of that? I, I don't agree with that. I'm not sure exactly what he was driving at because the four women he married were very different people. There was Nancy, his first wife, who I think he really always loved and I think she always really loved him. But she was a, uh, she was a, a girl from the block, right? She was beautiful in her own way. She was never glamorous. She was deeply feeling, deeply intelligent. And, but once Ava Gardner came around, uh, Sinatra was a dead duck. Well, uh, Ava Gardner uh, was, I would say, of the four wives, Ava Gardner was the most like Dolly of those four wives. She Dolly was, apparently loved her. Yeah, uh, Dolly loved really uh, Dolly. Yeah, because Ava was in her own image, except only gorgeous. <laughs> Dolly, <laughs> was, Dolly was under five feet and a little rotund. But uh, she loved that Ava, Ava could swear like a sailor, and Dolly could swear like a sailor. They loved that in each other. They got along like gangbusters. Uh, Frank's third wife, uh, Mia Farrow, no, nothing like Dolly. And his last wife, Barbara, uh, I, I wouldn't compare her to Dolly. She, Barbara is tough. She's still with us. She's a tough lady, uh, but uh, not volcanic the way Dolly is, and I wouldn't say brilliant the way Dolly is. I would say that, that, uh, that she and Frank took care of each other in Frank's older years. I think Frank once... Uh 
said of me uh, much later in life, said, uh, I still don't understand what that was about. Right, right, right. <laughs> and what was she, 18 or something? She was not, well, when they first got together, yeah, she was 18. It was sex at the beginning, but it wasn't just sex. Uh, she used to say that her measurements were 20, 20, 20. She was lying. That wasn't really true. Frank saw the truth, and he was excited by her. She was young. She was smart. She was very sensitive uh, and uh, artistic. The one thing that she had that proved to be the big cause of trouble was she was also extraordinarily ambitious. She wanted to be a movie actor and a movie star, and Frank did not want any wife of his to work, uh, and so it blew up very fast. Let's get back to the music, and, and it's one of the things I appreciate about your books is that you concentrate really, uh, not exclusively, but very heavily on the artist, the music, what he did. And so C Capitol Records in the 50s, middle mm. 50s, mm. Frank Sinatra and Nelson Riddle, mm. what was it about these two Two guys? geniuses, two geniuses. Sinatra didn't know who he was when they first met, but Nelson Riddle was a guy who listened to Ravel. He listened to Debussy. He loved the Impressionist composers. He also loved jazz. He loved the Jimmy Lunsford Orchestra. Uh, he loved all those things, and he could write magnificently. Frank had to teach him a couple of lessons. One less big lesson that he taught Nelson Riddle was, don't write too many notes because mm. my voice needs to be heard. And Riddle was brilliant enough to learn that lesson immediately and began no churning out, uh, it sounds too mechanical, he, he, he worked his behind off on these arrangements, uh, but these brilliant arrangements for so many great albums. They were two geniuses. They were two geniuses from New Jersey. How about that? Yeah. What, what are the odds of that? Yeah. I, those songs, I mean, what are some of your favorites from that period? Oh, well, I, I'm crazy about uh, In the Wee Small Hours, one of the greatest popular albums of all time. And the title song is one of my favorites. I love Come Fly With Me, both the song and the album. Uh, we're talking just about the capital years, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, those, those to me, uh, and Sinatra's Swing Session, uh, where, he, where he sings, I've got you under my skin. I've got you under my skin. It's just, it's one of the most staggeringly great uh, tracks of all time. It took him... 22 takes to get so I've Got You Under My Skin my right, but boy did he get it right. He sure did. Um, you mentioned In the Wee Small Hours, and it brings up the, the, the point of the creation, if you will, of the concept album. Yeah. There hadn't been this no. kind of... No, and, uh, and Sinatra really began that in his Columbia years, before they dropped him. He had this brilliant idea that an album, even though back in the Columbia years, an album meant a whole bunch of records inside, uh, inside this sleeve, this heavy package of four, three or four or five discs. Mm -hmm. That was an album. Uh, but he had this idea that there should be a unified sort of emotional feeling, uh, emotional uh, texture to the whole thing. And that, he was way ahead of his time. And he continued that thought in, at Capitol. In the wee small hours, of course, is is uh, dark uh, torch songs, I guess, if you will. And yeah. I'm reminded that uh, I guess it it was Nelson Riddle who said Ava taught him how to sing a torch song. She taught him the hard way. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She did teach him the hard way, and he he, he that emotion comes comes out in albums like that, but especially in the song um, that Frank did in one take, as I understand. I'm a fool to want you. That was back with Columbia, you. yes. And you know what was on the back of that single? On the back, that, not many people know this, on the back of I'm a fool to want you, that great, amazing torch song that Sinatra sang in one take and then ran from the studio in tears, all about Ava. On the back of that single is Mama Will Bark. The most, no. the most infamous single that Frank Sinatra <laughs> ever cut. How about that? I'd love to have one of those. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's a great uh, piece of trivia. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit more about the voice. I, I, I think Frank Sinatra said his instrument was the microphone. Yes. But his voice with the microphone equaled yeah. the instrument. The, the big surprise for me about writing these books, it wasn't any piece, unearthed piece of gossip. It was really 
how incredibly hard he worked on his singing at all times between building up his breath control. He learned a lot of these lessons from people he admired a great deal. Uh, he, when Frank was a very young man, he used to haunt West 52nd Street, which was lined with jazz clubs in those days, and he would see these great geniuses playing in all these basement jazz clubs, Lester Young, Teddy Wilson, mm. Count Basie, and especially Billie Holiday. He was knocked out by Billie Holiday. She was the same age as he was, uh, but she broke much sooner. She was 21 when she got right. famous, and she was an amazing singer. He knew it. He knew it. So he learned a lot about phrasing from her. When he went to sing with the Dorsey Band, he learned a lot about breath control from watching Tommy Dorsey hold these amazing long passages on his trombone. Uh, and uh, but beside and 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 Sinatra studied the lyrics. The lyrics of a song were incredibly important to him, maybe even more important than the music. He studied the lyrics as if they were a poem before he ever sang a note of the well, song. Well, that's what uh, interests, another thing that interests me about your book and, and you talk about how he used his voice, where he learned his lessons, the school of phrasing Tommy Dorsey and, and 50, West 52nd Street. But I, I'm still wondering yes how does this guy who dropped out of high school yes uh learn there's a difference between you know phrasing yes and interpretation yes. of lyrics yes w where did that come from the because interpretation this, this was a brilliant man this was a brilliant man and not only a brilliant man but despite the fact that he dropped out of high school at 16 years old he was always intellectually ambitious unlike his good pal Dean Martin who dropped out of high school at around the same age and for the rest of his life read comic books and watched westerns on TV Sinatra always had his nose buried in a big book he did the New York Times crossword puzzle in ink every day he was uh, he was a guy who thought a lot who uh, he was highly intelligent and again, he revered these great songwriters, these, uh, these, these men like Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, uh, Larry Hart, uh, uh, and, and Hammerstein, who had, had written, and, and then when he hired uh, Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Usen to write his songs, who wrote these terrific lyrics, these meant a great deal to him. And, uh, and that, that was a solid foundation for, uh, for his interpretations of these songs. He really, he revered, the, he revered the words, he loved the words, and he lived in those songs. And you, and you feel that when you hear him sing them. Let's talk just a second about one song that just illustrates the breath control, the phrasing to... Oh, boy. Uh, Old Man River. Oh, I knew you were going to mention that one. I, yeah. I have to. I yeah. just... Try and sing along with it sometime. I've done <laughs> yes. it. I've tried. Yeah. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to start gagging inhaler. and coughing about 30 inhaler. seconds in. Yeah, you need an inhale. This is a guy who he, he used to swim laps underwater in, in the swimming pool to build up his breath control. He would go into training before he made an album. He would cut down from his usual three packs of unfiltered camels a day to maybe two or one. Uh, cut down on the drinking a little bit, but but he also had he was gifted uh, with an, an extremely broad rib cage. Uh, the great singer mm. Joe Stafford told me that both she and Sinatra had these broad rib cages, so that helped him to be able to draw in an enormous amount of breath. Yeah, Old Man River, forget about it. He just try and stay with him, and then as he drops an octave and then comes back up, and he never takes a breath. You get a little drunk and you land in jail. Gets weary. And he never takes it. When does he take the breath? Try and find it. Yeah. In the uh, New Yorker, uh, this happens also to be the centennial of Orson Welles. Yes. And, and uh, he was a pal of Sinatra. Alex Ross, writing in the New Yorker, says that mostly we remember Orson Welles as a pompous wreck, mm. a man who peaked early, then devolved into hack work and bloated fiascos. Yes. Does it sound like Sinatra? No, not to no? me. Not to me, no. The, the, the last years had a lot of sadness in them. And there was that 
that political turn to the right, which a lot of people regret. Uh, not everybody regrets it, but he, there was the palling around with Spiro Agnew, the palling around with this white shoe, extremely wealthy crowd in Palm Springs. Uh, there was the Sinatra of the later years. This was the Sinatra when I went to see him in 1981 at Carnegie Hall that I was kind of expecting because I had seen Joe Piscopo and Phil Hartman on SNL uh, making fun of him with the bad toupe and the snapping the, the microphone cord and being thuggish and brutal on the on the And stage. some of those late concerts, those uh, live, you know, on stage, those, they yeah. were, I mean, the voice was raspy. Yes. The style was cheesy, if you uh, could it, say that about Sinatra. Yes, uh, it came, he, he played a number of cheesy venues. He also began to decline. His daughter Tina maintains that he began to decline mentally in the early 80s, and yet uh, he was kept on the road. I'm not, always, I'm not sure that he was always uh, uh, delighted to be on the road, but he was kept, a, he was like an old fire horse. This is what he did. There were great concerts, there were good concerts, there were fair concerts, and then more and more there were some bad concerts. He was forgetting the lyrics. Even with the teleprompters on stage and the lyrics in giant letters on the teleprompter, he was beginning to forget the lyrics. A couple of times he collapsed on stage. Very, very mm. alarming. So, listen, none of us gets great last years, right? None of us gets that. Sinatra is no exception. Mm. Sinatra is like the rest of us, only writ very large in every way. And, and his, and his uh, old age was not pretty. I was uh, surprised to learn his first wife, Big Nancy is still alive. At 98 years old. Yeah. And, and, and still, uh, still very sharp mentally. Were you, did you try to interview her? I tried to interview the whole family. When, yeah. I, when I began my first volume, I felt obliged to approach the family and say, will you talk to me for my book? I was totally brushed off. Now, when I began my second book, uh, I had, the first book had been optioned for the movies, and lo and behold, Tina Sinatra was part of the group that I was in for this right. movie option. So uh, I was granted an audience with Tina Sinatra, and we sat down and talked for a couple of hours. It, it got a little testy sometimes. <laughs> but uh, uh, I was told by Tina Sinatra and her lawyer, Robert Finkelstein, that they would gladly give me access to all kinds of materials, and they would talk to me if I would give them my manuscript before it was wow. published. And I elected not to do that. Yeah. Wise. Wise of you. Yeah. Well, among the many gifts Sinatra has given us here in the city is an anthem from a, yes. from a fairly mediocre movie. But yeah, well, it was a try. <laughs> yeah. not, not one of Scorsese's finest. No. But New York, New York yes. and Sinatra will live forever. James Kaplan, delight to have you here and thank you. Delight to be here. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you next week.